slide here. Well, welcome everyone to our third Thursday Lunch and Learn this September. Um, please, if you would, introduce yourself in the chat, who you are, where you are, your connection to Central. Um, our third Thursday Lunch and Learns is a chance for our Central community in the, the broadest sense of that word, students, alums, faculty, friends, staff, um, to gather and learn about scholarship, about ministry, or about personal interests of those within our community. It is a lunch and learn, so you are definitely invited to eat lunch or whatever meal it is in whatever uh, time zone or part of the world you are in. And we're excited today to have Hannah Yu and Sophie Che joining us. Hannah is the Registrar and International Student Officer at Central, and Sophie is the Executive Assistant to the President and Assistant to the Director of Doctor of Ministry Programs. And today they will be leading us as we learn about Korea then and now. So thanks so much, Hannah and Sophie. Thank you for having us. So um, hello, everyone. My name is Hannah. As Jessica introduced me, I am the Registrar and International Student Officer, um, and I've joined Central Community in November of 2019. It's an honor for me to talk about my home country, Korea, um, and Sophie and I are very excited to share um, Korean history, culture, and language with you all today. So let's begin. Um, Let's take a look at the world map and show you where I spent the first 20 years of my life. Um, you're, you're looking at a world map that most of you are familiar with. So here is where I am at right now, um, Overland Park, Kansas. So now, um, do you know where South Korea is on this world map? Yep, you should know, yes. <laughs> yep, here is where South Korea is located on the world map. And that's where Sophie and I and many of our Korean students were born and raised until they decided to follow their dream and start a new chapter of their lives in a new country. Um, let's move to the next slide. Um, now, what about this kind of world map? Has anyone seen this kind of world map before? Um, this is a world map Sophie and I grew up with, um, and the state of Kansas is right here. Um, please find where South Korea is on the map. You can see the Pacific Ocean between America and Asia, and this is where South Korea is located on this map. Um, as you can see, the Korean Peninsula is located at in located in the um, middle of the world map just because the earth is a sphere and we want to put South Korea in the center of the world map. Why not? Um, now we are going to, I'm going to show you an, uh, one more world map. So this is taking us to a new level, right? Um, any guess which country uses this map? Hint, which country is in the middle of the map? Australia. So that's right. You can see Australia is located in the middle of the map. Again, there is nothing wrong about that because the Earth is around sphere. So three world maps that I just showed you clearly demonstrate there are and there have to be different perspectives on everything. We Central welcome every student from every culture and every um, like various denominations. And I think it's very important for us to stay open to various perspectives and willing to accept um, our students as they are. I think Central has been doing a good job on accepting uh, various perspectives and ideas, having students read uh, Bible verses in their own language and encouraging them to sing in their native language at the commencement, chapels, and many other events clearly um, show that Central is open to differences and willing to accept them. Personally, hiring me as um, the first Korean registrar and international student officer um, for Central is definitely one of the examples that show Central is open to anyone and everyone. Um, now, when you think of South Korea, what comes to your mind? Many things. And then here are uh, things that I came up with. First one, North Korea. 
it's a big topic for one whole um, lunch and learn session. So we're not speak any more of it. So um, next is Squid Game, a South Korean survival drama television series on Netflix. And that was a big hit last year. Um, and then the movie Parasite, um, it won six awards, including the Best Picture Award at the 2020 Academy Award. And there are many other Korean movies that got uh, global attention. Um, I use uh, Samsung cell phone. Um, that's right. Samsung is the authentic pronunciation for uh, companies, the South Korean company that seems to be good at making any electronic products. I don't know if you know Samsung makes um, automobiles and sells them in Korea. Um, my parents drove, uh, had Samsung car for 20 years and now they have, they drive Hyundai Avante and my sister drives Kia, Kia Sportage. Um, next one is K-pop and K-drama and K-food. Thanks to BTS, a Korean boy band, and Blackpink, a uh, Korean girl band, K-pop is very popular uh, worldwide and that itself helps creating warm hospitality toward Koreans. I came to um, America, North America in 2002, and back then I was often asked um, if I were Japanese or Chinese. Um, no one asked if I were Korean, and people also greeted me with konnichiwa, which means hello in Japanese, or ni hao, that's um, hello in Chinese. 20 years have passed, things are, are looking totally different. When I pay for something at a store, a young cashier read my name on my credit card and ask if I'm Korean. I say yes, and her face gets um, frightened, and she says she loves watching K-dramas and loves one of the Korean boy bands. So um, things have changed a lot, and I'm glad um, more people acknowledge in my home country and have interest in learning about it. I even see a rapid increase in the number of non-Korean students joining the local um, Korean school here in Overland Park. I've been teaching there, um, teaching um, high school and middle school students there since 2017. And we now have about the same number of non-Korean students um, and the second or third generation of Korean students at the Korean school. Many of those non-Korean students um, have developed their interest in learning Korean language because of their love for K-pop and K-drama stars. Um, also, we cannot not talk about food um, because we like to eat and we need to eat. Um, kimchi, which is a traditional side dish um, of salted and fermented vegetables, such as napa cabbage, and Korean radish is a growing its popularity among many nations. Um, kimchi and ramen noodle makes the best combination. Um, if you haven't tried that combination, you have to. That could be a life-changing moment uh, for someone. So you're probably, <laughs> and you also uh, probably heard of a franchise called uh, Bibibap, and that franchise uh, developed their menus based on the traditional Korean dish called uh, bibimbap. Bibim means mixing and pap refers to rice. So um, um, there's also bulgogi, a marinated beef dish. And that's the one of the most popular and well-known Korean dish dishes. Um, these are the things that must have come to your mind when you think of South Korea. And now let's talk about the history of Korea. Korea has 5,000 years of history, and obviously we don't have enough time to talk about those 5,000 years. So today we'll focus on how Korea has changed since 1945. Here comes the question, why 1945? Because uh, World War II came to an end in 1945, leading to Korea getting liberated from Japanese colonization after spending 36 years under Japanese rule. Um, okay, let me move this one a little bit. OK. 
Okay, so um, National Liberation Day of Korea is August 15, 1945. It's a big deal to Koreans and it gets celebrated annually on August 15 in both um, South and North Korea. Between 1909 and 1945, Korea was ruled as a part of the Empire of Japan and Koreans suffered under the Japanese rule. Those 36 years of sad history had, com had come to an end on August 15, 1945 with the surrender of Japan in World War II. During those 36 years, Koreans fought for their independence, uh, leading to there being many movies and books describing hard times during the colonization. The most recent bestseller book called Pachinko is a novel written by a um, Korean American author, Min Jin Lee, and it's an epic history fiction epic historical fiction novel following a Korean family who immigrate to Japan. This sad history between Japan and Korea still uh, resides among Koreans. Even now, um, Koreans get get overly enthusiastic over like about soccer matches between Korea and Japan because we feel like we have to win over Japan at every soccer match uh, to pay back the hard times um, you had to go through. After getting freed from Japan, um, Korea thought that now they can live their lives um, in peace on the Korean Peninsula, but the leaders of Korea had different ideas, and that led to the Korean War. The leader of North side of Korean Peninsula wanted communism for the country, while the leader of South Korea, South side of Korea, wanted democracy for the country. The two leaders could not agree on one thing, and the Korean War began on June 25th, 1950, when North Korea invaded South Korea. North Korea was supported by China and the Soviet Union, while South Korea was supported by um, the United Nations, principally um, the United States. These um, photos show how destructive and brutal the Korean War was. The first picture on the left was taken after one of the palaces in Seoul, the capital city of South Korea, got bombed. And the top one on the right shows the Han River, which is a main river that runs through Seoul, and how soldiers had to cross the river during the war. The last picture shows North Korean soldiers fighting uh, with their flag in hand. On this slide, you can see non-Korean soldiers uh, fighting for peace and justice in the Korean Peninsula. I do not think any of these soldiers knew anything about Korea or even know where Korea was before they came to Korea to fight for Koreans. But they sacrificed so many things for us and we're forever thankful for their sacrifices, lives and love for humanity. I live in Overland Park, Kansas, and there is a Korean War Veterans Memorial on a 119th Street, next, right next to the Tomahawk Ridge Community Center. The Korean War Veterans Memorial in Overland Park, Kansas commemorates the service and sacrifice of those who served in the armed forces from 1950 to 1955 during the Korean War. Eight of the 30 panels carry the names of 415 Kansas soldiers who were lost in the war. I have uh, been there with my kids a couple of times and wherever, whenever we go there, I try to tell my kids how much sacrifice those young souls had to make to save my home country. Again, we are forever thankful. More pictures of the Korean War. The young girl in the picture on the left should be about 80 years old if she survived the war. Um, in this picture, she is carrying her little brother on her back because um, either her parents were missing or lost in the war or they were simply not in a position to take care of their young children. The picture on the right shows how Korean women dressed in, 1950, in the 1950s and how they carried things. They wore a traditional Korean cloth, clothing called hanbok, um, and it seems like it's easier for them to carry things on their 
head. Um, I am Korean, but I do not have that ability. So those talents must have faded away over the generations. Um, but how about Korean men? How did they carry things around in the 1950s? Let's find that out. Well, here they are. They liked carrying things on their back by using a wooden um, carrier called chige, and this is yeah very impressive. The Korean War broke in 1950 and lasted until 1953. Many parts of the country got destroyed, and many people lost their homes and family members. Too many have lost their lives because of this war. But as always, um, life goes on. During the Korean War, uh, Koreans met people from other countries, and I'm sure they had become good friends and share their culture, such as languages, food, traditions, and holidays. The picture on um, the right shows the prisoners of war enjoying a Korean wrestling match together. Again, um, horrible things happen, but life goes on and our history continues. In 1953, the Korean War finally ended when the Korean Armistice Agreement was signed. Korean Demilitarized Zone, aka DMZ, got drawn to separate North and South Korea, and some prisoners were allowed to go back to their home countries. Um, however, no peace treaty was signed, and the two Koreas are technically still at war, engaging in a frozen conflict. In April 2018, the leaders of North and South Korea met at the DMZ and agreed to work, to work toward a treaty to formally end the Korean War. Well, it's still work in progress, and I wish for a day that I do not need to say I am from South Korea, then I can just say I am from Korea. So the Korean War ended in 1953, and um, Korea was divided into two countries, North and South, and what happened after that? South Koreans worked hard to rebuild their country. This is a picture of a fabric factory in the 1960s, and those young workers look busy working. Uh, back in the 1960s, South Korea made wigs, shoes, clothes, and other easy-to-make items and heavily relied on exports. So when I look at uh, pictures like this, I think of my mom. Uh, my mom was one of those young factory workers. She graduated from middle school and started working at a shoe factory. She was 14 years old, already left home, living in a dorm and making money. Uh, look at me now. I'm the oldest of her two daughters. I went to college, earned a master's degree from a university in the U.S. and working as registrar and international student officer at a seminary in America. How things changed um, over the seven years. In the 1970s and um, 1980s, South Koreans kept working hard to have to build a better life for themselves and their future generations, focusing initially on textiles and footwear, footwear. South Korean manufacturing moved into steel, heavy equipment, ships, and petrochemicals in the 1970s, and finally electronics and automobiles in the 1980s. South Korea's economy was one of the world's fastest growing um, from the early 1960s to the late 1990s and still is, along with Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan, uh, the other three Asian tigers. Thanks to the rapid e economic growth, South Korea was able to host the Summer Olympics um, in Seoul in 1988, which was only 35 years after the end of the Korean War. Korea-Japan World Cup in 2002 and the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang in, 19, no, um, in 2018. Then these are these two pictures clearly show how South Korea has changed over the past seven years. Both pictures so uh, sh show the Han River, which is a major river running through the capital of South Korea, Seoul. The one on the left was taken right after the Korean War. 
and the one on the right was taken recently. It only took 70 years to transform a country from the most destructed and least developed to one of the leading countries in the world. People call that the miracle on the Han River. The rapid reconstruction of the South Korean economy during the latter half of the 20th century brought the following, the disparity between the poor and the rich, which is not, the, not only Korea's problem, but a major problem for other countries as well. And there was not enough time um, to build a strong and sturdy democracy within the country, which is um, one of the things we are still working on. Things are highly competitive in South Korea. As you have seen on the world map, Korea is a small country and it's even divided into two parts. The size of South Korea is 38,750 square miles. So it's about the size of the state of Missouri or Kansas. Um, and there are over 50 million people living there. So things are very crowded and it can be pretty tough. Because everything has um, changed so rapidly, getting things done fast is considered to be a good thing. Uh, we even joke that the very first um, Korean phrase any non-Koreans in South Korea learn is "pali pali." That means quick, quick. So if you ever feel like Koreans don't seem to have much patience, Please know it's not their fault. Uh, let's just blame the rapid reconstruction of the South Korean economy. Now I'm going to talk about Korean culture. First of all, Korean holidays. Uh, there is a lunar calendar, New Year's Day, AKA Chinese New Year's Day. And of course, other Asian countries like uh, to call it other than Chinese New Year's Day because other Asian countries celebrate it too. So um, because it follows a lunar calendar, the date for the lunar New Year's Day changes every year. In 2023, it will be on January 22nd. Um, on and on the new Lunar New Year's Day, families will get together to share good food, play some games, and catch up with each other. Uh, next one, March 1st Movement Day. Um, it is to commemorate a peaceful protest movement by Korean people and students calling for independence from Japan. The event occurs on March 1st, 1919, and March 1st is celebrated as a national holiday in South Korea. We have Children's Day, which is um, on May 5th, um, and we have Parents' Day, which is on May 8th. In America, we celebrate Mother's Day and Father's Day um, separately, but in Korea, we have one day to celebrate mom and dad. Um, the National Liberation Day, which I mentioned earlier, is on August 15th, and Korean Thanksgiving, Chuseok, um, is a major mid-autumn harvest festival, and it is on the 15th day of the 8th month of the lunar calendar on the full moon. We just um, had celebrated Chuseok last week, um, and I celebrated with my students at the Korean school. Mm. And there's Hunger Day um, that is on October 9th. Hunger is a Korean alphabet, and it is the official writing system for the Korean language. We'll talk more about it pretty soon. Uh, we also celebrate Christmas in Korea. Most Koreans do not celebrate Christmas as a religious holiday. Instead, they treat it um, as a day to celebrate with family and friends. Now it's time to talk about Hangul, the Korean alphabet. Um, King Sejong invented Hangul in 1443. Its consonants were invented following the shapes of vocal organs when making sounds, and basic vowels, vowel shapes are to represent the three basic elements of the universe, sky, earth, and human. The first shape, uh, the dot, represent the sky, and the second shape represent um, the flat horizontal line, and symbolizes the plate shape of the land. The third shape, the tall vertical line, indicates human beings who stand upon the earth under the sky. 
these three, sky, earth, and human, are considered as the fundamental features of all things in many East Asian philosophies. The sky shape that does not stand alone, so it needs to be added to the other two vowel shapes to make vowels. Um, let me show you how it works. There, um, where this vertical line is standing, you add the dot to the right of the vertical line and draw a line from the vertical line to the dot. It creates one of the vowels that make the sound ah. So this is how you make one of the vowel sounds using sky, earth, and human. Let me um, show you another example. This time we're going to place the dot first, then add the vertical line. And then you connect those two, and it creates one of the vowels that makes the ah uh, sound. Uh, another vowel, let's put the dot first, and then the horizontal line under the dot and connects the dot. Um, and the vertical line, then it creates a vowel looking like this, and it makes the O sound. Um, I have placed a Korean alphabet table for you. You can see 10 vowels on the top row of this table and 14 consonants on the first column of the table. So we have these vowels and consonants. How do you put them together to create any syllable? Uh, there are five Korean syllable blocks. Um, in English, you just uh, put any alphabet like right next to each other. That's how it works. But in Korean writing system, there are five syllable blocks that you can use. So the uh, first one is consonant and vowel standing right next to each other. And my example for this um, first Korean syllable block makes can anyone guess um, what sound this syllable would make? Let's play a guessing game. So it's got this um, consonant. The name of this consonant is kiok. It makes ku, ku sound. And you have, this is ku, and you have this um, vowel. And you can find it here. So ku plus a that makes ga ka ka ka. That makes the ka sound. Uh, I hope it's making any sense to you. So let's take a look at the second example. This is the second um, Korean syllable block. Uh, same consonant. Uh, so the consonant goes on top, and the, the vowel goes um, to the bottom. So the same consonant ku, and this time we are looking at this vowel, o, o. So ku plus o, ku, o, that you put them together really quick. Ku, 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 ku. That makes ku, ku sound. So these two, ka, ku. So now you learn how to read um, three syllables, like <laughs> ka, ko. And third one, um, consonant vowel, and it has the final consonant at the bottom. And this is, this consonant makes su, su sound, and this uh, vowel makes a. Ah. So su plus a, ah, it's sa, 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 sa. This makes sa. And there is a final consonant, nu. So san, 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 san. San uh, means mountain in Korean language. So you know, um, yeah, you just learned the first Korean uh, word. San, san means mountain. Next one, CVC, um, consonant, vowel, consonant, and they are on top of each other. Nu plus u. Um, it's right here. So nu plus u, that's nu, and final consonant nu, nu, nu. So nun, nun, nun. Nun um, can be your eye or snow. So it has two meanings, either um, snow or your eye. And this looks very complicated, but uh, oftentimes when there are two final consonants at the bottom, you um, 
either choose one of them or there are rules about that. But in this case, we just drop this um, snake looking thing, drop it, and then we just take k, k. So it's h plus u and k. That's hook, hook. That's how you pronounce um, Korean syllables. I hope I wasn't too uh, crazy and <laughs> made any sense to you. <laughs> So uh, I wanted to show you how you can text in Korean on your cell phone. As you can see, you don't need to create space for all 14 vowels because you can make any vowel by using the human. Um, human is right here. And sky and earth, basic vowel sounds. So this is such a cool thing about Hangul that the King Sejong invented. Um, um, this is why Hangul is considered to be a logical and scientific writing, writing system uh, because you don't need that much space. You don't need to lay out all the Korean alphabets um, to type or text. So um, let's see how you can text Hana, my name. Um, so I spell my name H-A-N-A. -A, so you need a consonant. Oh, earth just popped up. Consonant hu hu. This makes hu sound. So it's right here. So you tap on this button like twice, and it will give you this hu. Then you need um, ha ah ah ah. You need the vowel ah. And then how um, do you make ah? You need human first. Then click on. Oh, sorry. Then you need the sky. Then it will give you ha. So that's how you type um, or text uh, Korean. And my name um, ha na. So you need na, the second syllable um, in my name. And n n n is this um, consonant. So you touch this little button once. Thank you will give you new and same vowel. My name is so easy, um, easiest Korean name you can ever get. So uh, <laughs> new and, and I'm thankful that my parents gave me uh, such a good name that anyone, anybody can pronounce. Uh, new plus um, human, and then you need the dot sky. And then they will give you na and you put you lay them like right next to each other. That's Hana. That's how you text uh, your name, my name in um, like on your cell phone. So um, I talked about the Korean history since 1945, Korean culture and Hangul, the Korean alphabet. Um, now Sophie is going to talk about missionaries in Korea, her journey to central and simple but very useful Korean phrases. Uh, let's turn this over to Sophie. Do you, uh, maybe I need to um, stop sharing. Then Sophie can share her screen. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm super nervous, <laughs> super duper nervous. So, uh, yeah, I hope this goes well. Okay. <sighs> okay. Hi everyone, my name is Sophie. Do you hear me? Sound is okay? Okay. Here we go. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk about history of Christianity in Korea. And then I'm gonna talk about some of the Korean uh, short phrases and then uh, a few useful words that you can use to Korean anytime. So I'm gonna start. Okay, 2003, right after I became Christian, my church made a trip to Yang Ha Jin. The 40 missionary cemetery in Seoul, I was born in a family who had a strong belief in Buddhism and ancestor worship. 
just uh, <clears throat> so becoming a Christian was a very difficult decision. But I wanted to know how this wonderful Jesus movement had started in my country to have a better understanding of what I believe. I want you to join me to look back how Jesus' story had begun in the one of the smallest country in Korea. Christian teachings were first brought to Korea in 1603. The faith was brought not by foreign missionaries, but by Korean diplomats who came in contact with Roman Catholicism in Japan. The royal families called it an evil practice over 200 years. Horace Allen was a physician from Ohio who was initially sent to China by the Northern Presbyterian Church Board of a Foreign Missionary Missions in 1883. Unhappy in China, his medical friends advised him to go to Korea, which he did in 1884. Not long after, Prince Min young ik was a step during a fa failed uprising. Under Ellen's medical supervision, Min young ik recovered in three months. This left a favorable impression of Ellen on the royal family. In time, Ellen helped in removing anti-Christian policies that had previously limited Christian evangelism and Western business in Korea. Dr. Dr. John Heron was the first missionary to be buried at Yang Hwajin. He came to Korea in June 1885 as a medical missionary from the Presbyterian Church and worked as a doctor. Heron, who cared for Korean people through harsh and difficult condition, passed away five years after his arrival in Korea. Dr. John Heron was, no, sorry. Underwood, Dr. Underwood was born in London and immigrated to the United States at age 12. He graduated from New York University in 1881 and New Brunswick Theological Seminary in 1884. Dr. Underwood served as a Northern Presbyterian Church missionary in Korea, teaching physics and chemistry at Kwang Hae-won in Seoul, the first modern hospital of Korea. Horace Allen, the first missionary to arrive, focused on medical work and introduced many uh, techniques of Western medicine that had previously been unknown in Korea. King Gojong was impressed and granted Allen permission to open the country's first Western medi medicine <clears throat> facility, first called Gwanghaewon, uh, the meaning is the House of Extended Grace, then renamed the Che Jung Won House of Universal Healthfulness. The clinic later grew into the Severance Hospital affiliated with Yonsei University. The missionaries who arrived after 1885 focused on mainly on education and social service. Methodist missionary Henry Appenzeller opened a school for the orphans, which was later named the Pe Je Hakdang and endorsed by King Gojong. Traditionally in Korea, girls did not attend school. Missionary Mary Scranton, with the support of Queen Min, established the Iwha Hakdang Pear Blossom Academy, a missionary school for girls in 1886. Many of Korea's top university today have their roots in the missionary schools of the late 19th centuries including Yuhai Women's University and Yonsei University. It is easy to forget that North Korea used to be the one of the Asia strongholds of a Protestant Christianity. In 1900, only 1% 1 of the country's population was Christian, but that began to change after the Pyongyang revival or Korean Pentecost. In 1907, the first important movement for Korean Christianity. Presbyterian missionary William Blair preached the thousands of Korean men focusing on their need to turn away from their tradition and hatred of the Japanese people with whom Korea had a long history of a conflict. The missionaries and Korean Christians had been praying for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit for revival and repentance 
and he came on the Saturday night in January 1907. By the work of the Holy Spirit, not only Christian, but the entire city repented and even led to social reform. The fire of revival spread throughout Korea, and the first Korean missionary, Yi Gi Pung, started his mission in Jeju Island. The revival must have been the driving force behind the prayers that united the hearts of Korean Christians so that they could preserve their nationality without being shaken by the Japanese imperial oppression over 40 years. Despite having a relatively small population, South Korea was the second to only the United States in the number of missionaries in second across the globe in 2006. In 2016, there were more than 27,000 Korean missionaries ministering all over the world. More than half of Korean missionaries served in Northeast Asia, the United States, the Philippines, Japan, India, Thailand, Southeast Asia, Cambodia, and Russia. Korea is a missionary powerhouse. I'm sure that all of this was possible because of the sacrifices of the missionaries who gave up everything to come to Korea and gave their lives as well as their families to preach Jesus. My journey with Jesus has started in 2003. Spring of 2003, I was baptized by Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit gave me an open vision once, and I was having a meal with lots of people nearby ocean, and I just knew that I was there as a missionary. I wanted to be an African missionary, so I took French classes when I was in college. That's why my name is Sophie, not Sophia. Jesus led me into a missional church. I met my husband, David, while serving as a worship and evangelism team at my church in Korea. 2005, we started our family. His family moved to uh, America when he was nine years old. My in-laws were our missionaries. They helped the Panda Ache rebuild their foundation after the tragic tsunami for 10 years, founded NGO for Turkey and Syria refugees, and now they are ready for another chapter at Saudi Arabia. Through my home church in Korea, my in-laws, Jesus has led me into mission field, mission field by supporting missionaries, praying for them, and hosting missionaries to my house. As working at Central, I support lots of missionaries and ministers who work diligently for the good news of Jesus, and I am so thankful for that. Okay. Everybody ready to learn some more Korean? Okay, here we go. Korean and English has lots of uh, differences, but today we are focusing on three, only three. So not too much pressure, right? Okay, number one, <laughs> number one, uh, respectful words. We have a special words to respect um, elders or anybody older than me. Number two, order, word order. We are using different word, word orders. So sometimes you feel like if you, you feel like if you use a lot of Korean, am I becoming a Yoda? Because <laughs> the word order sounds like Yoda. Mm, meals, I am a, the kind of Yoda style you are learning in Korean. And number three, accents are different. <laughs> Jessica, thank you. <laughs> Accents are different. So let's talk about it. Now, number one, respectful words. So let's look at the first picture. Th those two little kiddos, they just met in the morning and they're saying, hi. They are friends, so they can say, annyeong. Okay. Hana, would you <laughs> unmute yourself and let's, let's practice some Korean. <laughs> Okay, yep. Hana and I are friends, so we can say, Annyeong, Hana. Annyeong, Sophie. <laughs> but when I see someone is older than me, or someone is some, someone that I respect, wow, a lot of respect I want to show, 
then I can say 안녕 to that person. So when you want to say 안녕 or hi to that person, you got to put 하세요 at the end. So you're going to say 안녕 하세요. But you just can't say 안녕 하세요. But you got to do bow. And when you say 안녕 하세요, this is how we use 안녕 하세요 in the right way. Okay, let's see some examples. In the morning, I meet Pam every day, <laughs> almost every day. So she is not my friend. She's my boss and she's older than me. And I really want to show, <laughs> right? I really want to show her my respect. So in the greetings, in, in English, I totally can say, hi, Pam. But in Korean, I need to bow and say, 안녕하세요, Pam. I really need to say it like this. <laughs> we say her name. Oh, right. Oh, You're not supposed to. Say, yeah. Uh, Dr. Durso. I can't say Pam. It's so rude if I call her first name <laughs> in Korean culture. So in English, at the end of the day, I will say, bye, Pam. See you tomorrow. But in Korean, I would definitely bow and say, 안녕히 가세요, Dr. Durso. This is how we respect uh, to people, show our respect, and then how we uh, do greetings uh, pro properly. And then when I want to say thank you, when I feel thankful for her, in English, I will say, thank you, Pam. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. In Korean, I will say, 감사합니다. 감사합니다. And I will bow again. 감사합니다. That's how we say 감사합니다 in respectful words. Okay, next. The order of words. Let's say you want to say, I like you to someone. I like you. The order for the sentence is I, subject, like, verb. You, object, right? In Korean, I like you is 나는 너를 좋아해. So 나는 너를 좋아해, verb. 나는, subject, 너를, object, and 좋아해, it's verb. Also, we can flip the words this or that way and still it makes this, it makes sense, makes sense, and the, the meaning is the same. In English, you can mix up the words like like you, I, you, I like. <laughs> Sounds like a Yoda a lot. In Korean, even though you mix up the words, it still makes sense. 좋아해, 너를. 나는 나는 좋아해, 너를. So. Yeah, maybe according to situations or circumstances, we mix up the words, but the meaning is, I like you. <laughs> Speak like you. Okay, number three. In, in English, um, the question start with two questions. Do you, does, and WH or is. Also, the intonation rises at the end of the question. For example, you met your friend at a meal time and you want to know your friend is hungry to order something to eat together. You might ask like, hey, did you eat lunch? Did you eat dinner? Did you, how was your breakfast? In Korean, the most often question we ask between friend is, did you eat? Which is, 밥 먹었어? 밥 means meal, 먹었어? means did you eat it's just like how are you or what's up Pam mo listen carefully pop mogoso i ate it pop mogoso is pop mogoso it's a question did you eat and then when you say annyeong annyeong it's goodbye but annyeong when I say, when I rise the, um, the accent at the end of the sentence, it's question, it becomes a question. So, 
hello or hi, but we say annyeong, and it rises up. And I like you. Chua he. I like you. Chua he. But chua he? Do I like you or do you like me? So it became questions. So the sentence, uh, question sentences, when you, if you can just write the end of the sentence and then it becomes question. Okay, Jessica, are you ready? <laughs> okay. Oh no. <laughs> Really easy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Number one, number one is when Sophie met Jessica in the hallway, what should Sophie say to her in Korean? Number one. And there was no Jessica. Or number two. Annyeong. Annyeong. Yay! <laughs> you got it right. Woohoo. Okay. Number two. <laughs> okay, you can volunteer for this question to add que the answer to the question. Anybody want to volunteer to? Oh, Heidi. Okay, Heidi, Dr. Baxter, you got it. Number two, when Sophie met Dr. Park in the hallway, what should Sophie say to him in Korean? Number one. 안녕하세요, Dr. Park. Oh, number two. Annyeong, Dr. Park. Which one? Two one or two? Woohoo! Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. As Dr. long as I don't have to say it in Korean. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but do you want to try saying in Korean? Annyeong, haseyo. Annyeong, haseyo. Woohoo! Dr. Baxter. Thank you. That was really good. Your pronunciation is amazing. Thank you so much. Okay. And then two more words. Let's learn. See, I'm talking like a Yoda already. Okay. Number one is thank you. And it's 감사합니다. Oh, Craig, you can do that. Try. <laughs> I see you over there. <laughs> Okay, okay, let's say, 감사합니다. Oh my gosh. <laughs> 감사합니다. 합니다. Amazing. Woohoo, amazing. You did it. Okay, second one. I love you, and it is 사랑해. 사랑해. Dr. Stewart, you want to try? <laughs> I just got kicked off Zoom and got back on. Okay, oh, say it for me one more time. <laughs> Sarang-he. Sarang-he. I love you too, Dr. Stewart. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Okay. That was the end of my part. And then I'm giving this mic to Hannah again. Yeah. Thank you, Sophie. That was a lot of fun. I knew you would do so well. <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> so, um, so if you are uh, local in Kansas City area um, and want to experience like real Korean culture, um, there is a third annual KC Arirang Festival. It's going to be on um, August 15th and 16th, and there will be K-pop festival. So you can bring your kids if they're interested in uh, interested in K-pop, like k drama, k uh, boy bands or girl bands. Um, K-pop festival and K-traditional music festival. I am so um, excited about K-traditional music festival. I love Korean traditional music and there will be um, two shows like K-pop and K-traditional music on Saturday. And on day two, uh, there are gonna be Korean culture workshop. Um, you can learn Korean. Like uh, you, we briefly talked about hunger and you can go even deeper. Um, for a Korean language and let's learn K-pop dance. 
Uh, if anybody's interested in uh, learning some movements, um, go for that one. And let's make kimchi, the fermented Korean um, cabbage dish. So there are three sessions. And if you are interested, let me know. I can send you out the registration link. Uh, I'll be there. So um, if you want, uh, want more information, let me know and it will be fun. Uh, would you, Sophie, go to the next uh, page, please? Yes. And then any questions? Do you have any questions? We talked a lot and covered many things, many parts of South Korea um, culture and history and all that. Do you have any questions? I have one question, and I'm sorry yeah. if you said this and I missed it. Um, how mm. long was um, was Korea under Japanese colonization? 36 years, 36 years. It's from 1909 to 1945. So the end of the World War II was um, great news for Koreans. Thank you. Yep, yep. If you don't have any um, questions, maybe we can watch uh, uh, some movements, like some dance movements. Sophie, should we go for that one? The next page, yes. Did you do the um, share sound as well? When you I think so. okay. is it is I don't hear no. Hmm. Then Hannah, would you try mm -hmm. on, oh. on your end? Yes, yes, I can. Yeah. I need to has anyone ever been to Korea or any desire to go to Korea? you go, let us know. We'll give you all <laughs> kinds of tips and info. Uh, share does, sound. does going to the airport in Korea count? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, we've landed, right? Had a few hours set your foot. in Seoul. <laughs> yeah, was that Incheon Airport? Yes. Yeah, that airport is amazing. I love the Incheon Airport. It you really can do a is. lot of things. Yeah, it's very modernized and fancy. So I think a that lot still of counts. shopping there. Yes, and you <laughs> smelled Korea, didn't you? Like that's the one thing. Uh, whenever I go to a new country, the smell. Like as soon as you land, um, every country has different, unique smell. True. So yeah, as soon as I land, I smell Korea, and I'm like, ah, oh, I'm home. So. <laughs> Thank you both for doing this. This has just been really fantastic. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, okay, if you don't have any questions, we'll end our presentation by watching this uh, Feel the Rhythm of Korea Soul. Jessica, want to say something? Yeah, just thank you both yeah, so yeah. much. I learned so much in the last hour, more than I have in a really long time. And you all are wonderful teachers, and we're lucky oh. to have you at Central. I guess Corey knows um, this group, right? Inalchi. So you're. I know. Uh, I met him. At, met him at the student orientation, and he emailed me. He's in Canada. He emailed me that you are going to Korea. Is it this year or next year? I'm hoping to, um, no firm plans at this point, but it's still kind of a, a dream that we're actively pursuing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I was happy to get an email from you and uh, yeah, he wanted, you wanted to learn more about Korea and Korean culture, I'm so glad you joined us yeah. today. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you all so, so much. Um, 
the recording of this, if you want to reference it later, practice your Korean alphabet, um, <laughs> will be up on Central's YouTube page in the next day or so. Um, and I hope you'll join us for our next um, Lunch and Learn, which will be on October 20th with Dr. Julie Kilmer. And the title is Exploring Chaplaincy. And I just put the registration link there in the chat. Hana and Sophie, thank you so much. It was really wonderful to spend this hour with you all and to learn so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Be Take well. Take care. Bye.